Thanks. Um, yeah, so first of all, I wanted to say uh, what a pleasure and an honor it is to speak at this conference for Alain. So, um, happy birthday, Alain. Um, okay, so I just want to start off with just some motivation for what I'm going to talk about. Um, so, I imagine that everybody here knows what a calligraph is, since you're all friends of Alain, I don't see why he'd be friends with someone who doesn't know what a calligraph is, but I'll just, I'll just remind you, just in case. Um, so, we have a group G, which is finally generated by a set S. Um, so, for the rest of this talk, the groups will be finally generated. Uh, the calligraph, so the vertex set of the Cayley graph is just the uh, group G itself. And then recall that we connect two um, elements of the group. If we can jump from one to the other using one of the elements in our finite generating set. Okay, so this gives us a graph. Uh, and the... Uh, the properties of this graph um, mean that uh, we really can investigate the group uh, using this geometric object. So, uh, so okay. So this is a graph. So it's a metric space, just using the shortest path metric. Uh, the group acts by isometries on this graph by left multiplication. So we can use the group action as well. Um, Okay, and so and there are many connections between properties of this graph, so geometric properties of this graph, and um, uh, algebraic or structural properties of the group. Okay, so most famously uh, Gromov's polynomial growth theorem, okay, which says that uh, which says that a group is uh, virtually nilpotent if and only if. if and only if the uh, Cayley graph has polynomial growth. Okay, so that is, if we fix um, some element and we look at balls about that element, if the number of elements in such a ball grows polynomially with the radius, then um, we say that the group has polynomial growth. Okay, so that's all very nice. Um, and uh, oh yeah, and I should mention also, obviously if we change the generating set S, then we get a very similar object. So we get something that's quasi-isometric. So something that is essentially the same as the Cayley graph with the other generating set uh, up to finite perturbations of the metric. Okay. So, okay. And the object I'll talk about now is a, a kind of um, spin-off of, of this idea. So if our group has lots and lots of finite quotients, okay? So if our, so from now on, our groups will be residually finite. Okay, so recall residually finite means that um, for any non-trivial element in our group, we can find some finite quotient of our group in which that element remains non-trivial, okay? So. If we restrict to such groups, um, it would be a shame not to use the fact that we know that it has so many finite quotients in order to, to investigate the group. So what we can do is we can actually use the Cayley graphs of the finite quotients uh, to make a space which kind of encodes the geometric behavior of all of these finite quotients. Okay, so that's what's um, known as a box space. And so to make a box space, what do we do? Well, we take some uh, sequence so we'll take a sequence of subgroups of G um, and we'll call it a filtration. Uh, 
if um, each of these is a normal subgroup of G. Um, sometimes we want it to be nested, uh, so we'll maybe have, we'll add that for now. It's not always necessary. Um, but most importantly, we want these to be, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, this should be a finite index as well. Okay, so these are finite index normal subgroups, and we want them to have trivial intersection. Okay, so, so that when we take successive quotients by normal subgroups in the sequence, we will, in a way, approximate the group. Okay, we're going to get closer and closer to G. So, and the object that we can make using such a filtration is a box space. So, um, G is residually finite, finitely generated. Uh, so the box space of G with respect to a filtration and I, which we'll write in this way, using this kind of box, um, is the following object. So as a set, it's just the disjoint union of these finite quotients of G by the various subgroups and I. And we want it to be a metric space. Okay, it's going to kind of play the role of a Cayley graph for us. Um, so we want to put a metric on it. I'm going to put the following metric, D, which, well, there's a very natural thing to do on each finite piece in this disjoint union. Okay, so if we fix some generating set S of G, uh, then we can induce a Cayley graph metric on each of these finite objects just via the image of S under the quotient map. Okay, so um, let's say D restricted to each of these pieces is just the Cayley graph metric induced by S. Okay, and that, I mean, that's all really we care about because we want to study the uh, geometric behavior of all of these finite quotients uniformly. Okay, but a nice way to do that is to actually put them all into one metric space. So I'm actually going to define also a distance between each of the pieces, but don't worry too much about that because what's important really is that you have a space which, just one space which contains all of these finite quotients. Okay, so I'm just going to set this distance to be. Um, I make some choice of this distance so, so that this distance is bigger than the maximum of the diameters of these finite quotients. Okay. So, and this choice doesn't matter very much. I mean, I just want to be able to talk about all of the finite quotients together without them overlapping each other, basically. Okay. Okay, so, um, so that's a box space. And it turns out that this is also quite a nice object um, which can detect lots of properties of the group G. Um, so first of all, what, what are some of the properties of this, this object which allow us to, to detect these various properties? Well, first of all, uh, just as in the case of the Cayley graph, if we change the generating set, we get uh, an object which is equivalent in some sense. So, um, so the properties. Okay, so it's invariant in a certain sense under change of the generating set. And um, what, the, what is the correct notion of in, in, invariance here? So um, this is something called course equivalence. So if we have two metric spaces x and y, then f is a course equivalence.
if uh, there exist some maps um, which bound how much f distorts the distances um, when we go from x to y. Okay, so um, I'm going to have some, some control maps, rho minus and rho plus, which just go from the positive reals to the positive reals. We want these to be increasing. And we want uh, the limit of these maps to tend to infinity. As t tends to infinity. Um, and we want, so yeah, so we want these maps to bound how much the metric is distorted when we pass from x to y. So we want the distance in y of the image uh, of some point x to the image of some point y to be bounded by these functions of the original distances. <coughs> So zero to zero or not? Um, not necessarily, no. Um, so this is a little bit like a quasi-asymmetric embedding at the moment. If you just replace these row plus and row minus by linear maps, then you get something stronger, a quasi-asymmetric embedding. But here we don't care about these maps too much as long as they as long as they tend to infinity. <coughs> okay? And obviously that would be a coarse embedding, but we want a coarse equivalence, so uh, we also want some constant such that the image of x is kind of coarsely denser in y. So uh, such that, let's just say, for all y and y, the distance between the image of x to y is bounded by c. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, the kind of the correct notion of equivalence for this talk. Um, and um, so we have this nice invariance under the change of the generating set in particular. So what I meant is that uh, if I take the box space with respect to some metric induced by a generating set, then we're going to have, and I'll write this for course equivalence, and we'll have that these two things are coarsely equivalent if I change my generating set to some S prime. Okay, another nice property uh, of these spaces is that we can recover the information that's given to us by the Cayley graph if we go, if we're willing to go far enough along our filtration. So, if we um, if we choose some radius r, then if we choose an index big enough, then the r balls in um, the box space from that point onwards will look exactly like R balls in the group, uh, in, the, in the Cayley graph of the group. Okay, so for all R, there exists some, let's say, I, such that for all N bigger than or equal to I, the ball in the Cayley graph of G of radius um, R is just going to be isometric to the ball in the box space, um, sorry, the ball in any of the pieces of the box space from the point i onwards of radius r. Okay, so we can see any finite piece of our Cayley graph that we wish in from some point onwards in our box space. Okay, good. Um, and so, as I mentioned, there's lots of nice connections between geometric properties and um, geometric properties of this box space and properties of the group. So, just to give you uh, a motivating example, um, so if we take G with property T, cash dense property T, so this is a rigidity property of actions on Hilbert space, then if we take the box space, or well, if we look at the pieces of the box space, then uh, these pieces will be expanders with a uniform expansion constant. So what is an expander? I'm going to talk more about those, so I'll just define it quickly for you. So um, 
An expander sequence is a sequence of finite graphs. which are extremely well connected, but yet do not have uh, too many edges. Okay? So, um, so we want the following properties to hold. So we want these graphs to get bigger and bigger. Okay? We want the degree to be bounded by some uniform constant for all of the uh, for all of the vertices in all of the xi, so and uh, we want the Chiga constant, which is a measure of, co of connectivity, to be bounded uh, from below for each of these graphs. Okay, so. Just write okay, where epsilon is a uniform constant across all of the i. Um, ah, I've messed up my board technique. See, Alain Alain actually taught me how to use three boards because you know I came from from the UK, a country where we can only afford two boards. <laughs> he taught me how to use the three boards. He told me always start in the middle and then go to the front and then go to the back. But I messed it up. I'm sorry, Alain. <laughs> um, so what can I do? OK, let's do it like this. So. Um, yeah, so what's the Chica constant? I'll just quickly define it for you. So uh, if we have some finite graph X, um, so what we look at um, is we look at some finite subset A and X. We look at the boundary of A, which is the number of edges that you'd have to remove in order to disconnect A from the rest of the graph. Okay, so for example, this is my X and here's A. Okay, it's all of these edges here, which are connecting A to the rest of the graph. That's the boundary. Um, and I need to divide through by the, um, the number of vertices in A. And I take the infimum over this, okay, where I guess I should take A to be, at most, half the number of vertices of X. And this is the trigger constant. Okay, so it's measuring how uh, easy is it to disconnect x, but it's taking into account the size of the subset that we're actually disconnecting. Okay, so uh, it is a measure of connexity. And um, okay, yeah, so we have the definition of expanders now. Okay, and this was actually, so this is a, a result of Margulis, I should say. Um, so it was him who first realized that if you take a property T group, then you get an expander as the box space. And um, this was actually the first explicit construction of expander graphs. So these are very useful objects in uh, computer science and network design. And uh, this gives you a systematic way to, to create these graphs. OK, so um, I think that's enough motivation for why these are nice objects. Um, so what I'd like to talk about is some questions concerning the uh, rigidity of these objects. So, um, and there's some motivation I just want to mention the following purely algebraic question um, which I think uh, is not maybe directly related, but I think it's, um, it's kind of an algebraic version of the question that we're going to answer in a second. So um, imagine I give you a residually finite group, okay, and I, I'm going to look at the following object associated to this group. Um, okay, so just look at the class 
uh, sorry, I'm going to look at the set of isomorphism classes of finite quotients of this group. Okay, so it's going to be the set of finite quotients of G up to isomorphism. Okay, so I give you this uh, residually finite group. Well, sorry, I give you. The, the, the set of finite quotients up to isomorphism of, the, of this residually finite group, and I ask you, can you tell me what the group is? Okay, so how rigid is, is the group under this, this algebraic object here? So in particular, a question of Remeslinikov, which is still unanswered, is as follows. Um, can you actually tell that uh, suppose I give you the set and you can see, oh, it's actually the set of all finite quotients of a free group. Okay, so um, if I give you such a set for a residually finite group and I tell you it's exactly the same set of... I know, what is that letter? Uh, I guess it's a C. <laughs> But it can be whatever you want it to be. C for C for, <laughs> C for, uh, for class, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Why, why is it a C? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I should have made it an A or something in honor of Alain. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, if I if I tell you that the uh, the set of finite quotients of a group is exactly the same as that of a free group. Can I actually say that my group is free? Okay, and this is still unknown, this is still open, although there has been some progress on this by uh, Brightson, Conda, and Reed. <coughs> if you assume some additional things about your group G, if you assume that it belongs in a certain geometric class, then you can conclude that. Free groups are rigid in this way, but in general it's open, which is kind of weird. G's finally generated. Uh, G's finally generated, yeah. So is this equivalent sign is for isomorphism? Yes. Yes, this is isomorphism, sorry, yeah. Can you conclude that G really is a free group? Okay, and so with this question in mind, um, let's think about what this could be in the world of geometry. So the question we're going to think about is, uh, suppose that I have some residually finite group G and I have a filtration, I take the box space and then I take um, another group H. Suppose I know that the box spaces are geometrically similar. What can I conclude about the groups? What can I conclude about the groups G and H? Okay, so that's going to be what we'll be looking at. Um, so, uh, so in the definition of these box spaces, you took the G over N I with the world metric, mm -hmm. but you, you made them disjoin with some <coughs> fixed distances which are large enough, but mm -hmm, exactly. they were arbitrary. And so this is a choice, and so how can... Yeah, so the choice actually doesn't make a difference for the uh, course equivalence class of the, of the box spaces. So if I, if I choose the distances to be growing, as I did, because I wanted them to be bigger than the diameters of the pieces that I'm separating, then actually this choice doesn't make any difference with respect to the course equivalence class. So, um, okay, uh, so the first result that we have in this direction is joint with Allah. And so what we were able to observe is that um, so if you have this course equivalence between to box spaces, then this actually implies a geometric similarity between the groups. So, I mean, here I mean the K-graphs of, of G and H, 
Um, so she implies that um, G and H are quasi-asymmetric. Okay? And this probably isn't very surprising because as we uh, as I told you, as we move along the sequence of, uh, that makes up the box space, we see bigger and bigger pieces of the K graph, and it turns out that you can actually uh, glue these things together to form a quasi-asymmetry between the whole K graph. Okay, but... Uh, and what can be said about the opposite direction? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not true. It's not true. In fact, um, for, the, for the opposite di direction, it's even kind of difficult to, to, to see what, what kind of question you might ask because uh, something I forgot to mention is that um, so if you just fix your group G but you vary the filtration, uh, you actually get wildly differing coarse properties. So you can actually have groups for which, um, with respect to some filtration, you actually get expanders and with respect to another filtration, you get something that embeds into Hilbert space, which is kind of an opposite behavior. So you can really get all kinds of behavior if you vary the filtration enough. So it's not really clear well, what there would be the... There is a canonical filtration, you can just take all. Oh, you can take uh, all of them. Um, yeah, you could, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, so Thibaut Delaby, who's here somewhere, um, he's investigated uh, these objects as well. This is something we call full box spaces. Uh, this is also yeah, an interesting question, what happens when you take all of them. But here, um, in general, we take them to be nested, so we don't take all of them, but yeah. it's also interesting. So in, in your statement, G has property T implies that all of these bonds... Yes, exactly. There it's all of them, yeah. For the, for the free group, for instance, you have a mixed situation. Okay, so um, right, so so this is um, kind of maybe not that surprising as I was saying, but um, you can get some nice corollaries from this. So, uh, in particular, one can answer the following question of uh, Mandel and Nao, um, who asked. So remember, we had these expanders, which are very nice uh, coarse objects, which people are interested in. But how many do we actually construct, for example, via these groups with property T? So how many how many expanders are there? Where by this, of course, I mean up to course equivalence. Okay, so perhaps there's only really one course equivalence class of expanders. That would be kind of a shame. Um, and indeed, this, uh, this result allows us to, to answer this question. Well, actually, sorry, I should say, of course, that Mandela and Nao kind of answered their own question uh, in a sense. So they uh, constructed two examples of expanders which were coarsely different, where one had a large girth, so where girth is the length of the smallest cycle, so they constructed a sequence where the girth tends to infinity, and another sequence where the girth does not, and proved that these were not coarsely equivalent. But... Um, there was no kind of scheme to, to show um, that any of the other examples are coarsely different. So, so using this result with Alain, we're able to show that, for example, if you take um, if you take some groups which you know are not quasi-asymmetric. So, um, for example, if you take um, various groups of property T, <coughs> you can actually get infinitely many course equivalence classes of expanders from property T groups. You can get continuum many, but um, I guess for continuum many, you kind of have to cheat a little bit. You have to vary the sequence of subgroups that you take. So, yeah, but you can get continuum many. So there are no continuum many groups with property T of two quasi Uh No. It's oh, I don't know. It's still some. Yes. Sorry. No, oh, that's a different question. Well, is it? Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's a related question. Um, are there? Are? Okay. Yeah. yeah, then you can just bind it in this. Okay. Oh, then, then, yeah, okay, then, <laughs> then yes. Um, yeah, think of this as continuum in that case. Um, 
so, so for example, if you take uh, various SLN, so by a result of Eskin, if you take SLNZ and SLMZ for n not equal to m, then these are not quasi-asymmetric groups, and so the expanders that you get from these uh, groups will not be coarsely equivalent. Um, okay, so maybe I should also mention some related results. So David Hume uh, also proved that there is a continuum of uh, non-coarsely equivalent expanders, but using different methods which only work for um, expanders of large girth, so with girth tending to infinity, uh, he used something called separation profile, which was uh, invented by Benjamini Schramm and Timar uh, for different purposes, I think. So, um, okay, so yeah, that, that gives you a whole other uh, bunch of expanders. And I should also mention a result by uh, Kajal Das, uh, who proved that if uh, <coughs> two box spaces are coarsely equivalent, then this actually implies a uniform measure equivalence for, for the groups. So he kind of extended this result in a measure theoretic direction. Okay. Ah, and uh, maybe another thing I should mention is a result by De Latt and Vigolo, who proved that... Um, who did a, a similar kind of thing for warped cones, which are a kind of sister object of box spaces, which uh, allow you to construct interesting examples of finite graphs using uh, group actions, okay, rather than quotients. Okay. Okay, so now um, let's go on to something different. So, okay, so. Uh, we know from Cayley graphs uh, that it's very satisfying them when we can um, assume some geometric property for the Cayley graph and have some kind of algebraic or analytic or structural conclusion for the group. And so it would be nice if, um, with these box spaces, if we could assume some kind of geometric uh, information about the, the box spaces. So if we could assume that the box space is of course equivalent, but get some kind of structural information about the groups. Okay? Here we, we, we could get um, some geometric information, but what about some kind of algebraic information? So this brings me on to this brings me on to the next part of the talk. Um, and this is joint work with Thibaut de la Bie, who is presumably still in the same place as he was before. <laughs> um, and Thibaut is um, our son with Alain, so he's a joint PhD <laughs> student. <laughs> um, and we're very proud of him. <laughs> um, Okay, so yeah, just some motivation for this then. So, okay, so what we'd like to do is we'd like to take this uh, geometric equivalence between the box spaces and deduce something about, for example, the subgroups which we actually used to create these spaces. So, um, okay, imagine, imagine if our group was free. Okay, if I if I look at the fundamental group. That's a really good way of detecting. So if I look at the fundamental group of a Cayley graph of a quotient of a free group by some normal subgroup, then exactly what I'll get is the, the subgroup N. Okay, so for the case of free groups, I have this very nice way of detecting the subgroup by which I've quotiented by looking at the fundamental group. Okay, remember the fundamental group, it's the, it's the loops that you have in your space. And here, of course, we've we've made exactly the elements of n into loops, so we detect exactly this group, okay? Um, in general, this may not work, okay? Well, in fact, it won't work if I look at 
in the Cayley graph of some non-free uh, group quotiented by some subgroup. Okay, this will not be equal to n. Okay, and why is that? Well, if I think about the loops that I've got in this space, um, I'm not just detecting the elements that are in n, I'm also detecting the elements which are already loops in G. Okay, so the... Sorry, uh, I'm confused. How do you want a Cayley graph of... The free group quotiented by some by some normal subgroup. But I thought so with respect to the free generating set um, of Fn. But I'm confused. The pi long for graph isn't that always a free group? Yeah, exactly. But n yeah. is a free group. Oh, n is yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> everything's fine. <laughs> In the end, everything's yes, fine. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, yeah, the, the, the um, pi 1 of a graph is always a free group, so that's a reason, in some sense, why this doesn't work for a general group G, right? Because, you know, if you think about what this quotient will look like, you're, as loops in the space, okay, you've got the elements that are, that are now trivial, the elements of n, but you also had already loops in the Cayley graph of G, so you're also going to be detecting those. So, that's no good. So what you'd like to do is you'd like to be able to mimic this behavior in some sense for a non-free group, okay? And the way to do that is via these um, um, coarse fundamental groups. So we need a coarse version of pi 1. And in, in fact, there already existed one um, which was created by... Barcelo Kramer Laubenbacher and Weaver. Okay. Um, okay, so let me talk you through what this course version is. So um, we're going to define what our paths are, first of all. So we're going to fix some parameter r. For example, r equals 60. I really tried to get 60 into my talk, but <laughs> I, I, there's nothing, there's, there's no numbers. Um, so yeah, if you fix some kind of parameter r, we're going to look at the fundamental group on this scale. Okay. So, so what I'm going to define, first of all, are our paths. Okay, and our paths are just going to be maps from a discrete set of um, integers up to, say, the length of this path. Let's call this map P. That's going to be a path. So in the, in the normal fundamental group case, um, paths are continuous maps from the interval to your space. Here we've got this map, which is going from a discrete set of... Um, cardinality length of this path to um, our space x. So yeah, let's fix some metric space x. Uh, for us, it's just going to be a Cayley graph. So uh, let's fix some base points as well. Um, and we want this map to be uh, our Lipschitz. OK, that's going to be our replacement of continuity in this discrete case. So and of course now we want to define what the <coughs> correct notion of homotopy will be for these discrete paths. And in order to define that, I'm just going to, first of all, define a, another notion called R closeness. So I'm going to say that two paths, P and Q, are going to be R close if uh, one of the following two conditions holds. So one of them is, is uh, quite sort of obvious, okay, if I have some path, okay, maybe this is my R path in my graph X, okay, I'm going to say that this other path is 
are close to it if it has the same length, so if L of P and L of Q are equal, and each of these distances is bounded by R. Okay? So that's a very natural notion of uh, equivalence between these paths. And uh, the other version just takes into account what happens when uh, P and Q have different lengths. So I'm going to also allow them to be R close if, um, so one path does something, okay, maybe the other path is longer than it. So what it does, it just does exactly the same thing as this path, but then it just stays, stays here, okay? So it just waits for the other path at the end. Okay, so this doesn't involve R, but R is involved there. Okay, and now, so I, now I can define my notion of uh, homotopy. So this is just for the end or also in the middle or? Uh, just at the end, yeah. It's just allowed to wait for it at the end. Yeah. So this what I would call fellow traveling? Ah, uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess it is, yeah. Is, does fellow traveling have a, like a parameter associated to it? Yeah, I, so, but I, I mean, you would be allowed to go at different speeds along the movie, and I thought that's what you were going to do there, but it's not. Um, I guess if you compose these two moves, then it's going to end up being fellow traveling, actually, probably, yeah. Yeah, so because what, what we're going to do now is we're going to be able to use both of these moves to move from one path to another path. Mm -hmm. um, except, I guess, what we're going to lose is the control on the parameter at each... Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to write it down then, yeah. Uh, so, so P and Q are, are homotopic if uh, there's some sequence of paths PI such that we start off at P, we move up to some path PN, <coughs> which is going to be Q, and uh, each pair of paths, um, we each pair of consecutive paths are going to be R close. Okay, so we can make these moves via these two um, relations of R closeness from P to Q. But I guess what we do is, I mean, we don't care about how big N gets. So we, we might be making a lot of these moves um, so that we kind of lose control on this parameter r. We can no longer say that the paths p and q are very close, but we can get from one to the other by some number of paths which are close to each other. And the endpoints are, are the same, or they can change also as you? Uh, yeah, the endpoints can change because here they can, yeah, they just have to be close. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's um, a discrete version of homotopy, and now we can define this discrete fundamental group or coarse fundamental group in the obvious way. So this coarse fundamental group at scale R of X with base point E is just going to be the uh, set of loops based at E. So, well, let's say R loops. Based at E up to our homotopy. Okay, and so why why is this a good idea? What can we do with this? Well, the main thing is that now using these moves of our closeness, we can actually uh, via our homotopy jump over holes of size around two R or R if you want. So now you know if we have some path. If we have some loop that does something like this, if this length is less than 2R or R, well, some, some, something in terms of R, then this we can actually homotope down to uh, just the trivial loop in our space. Okay, so we can ignore short loops. Um, and what this allows us to do is the following thing. So... Um, now, if we take a group in which we can actually control um, how big... Remember, remember the problem here, wh why didn't pi 1 work, is because we, in this pi 1, we got the loops of G mixed up among the loops from N. So if <coughs> the loops coming from N and the loops coming from G are far enough apart in length, then we can actually pick a parameter R 
um, take the fundamental group at scale r and it's going to kill off all the groups that are coming from g and it's going to preserve all the ones that are coming from n. So that's the, that's the idea here. So and where, what kind of group can we do that in? Well, it's a finitely presented group, right? So if we have g, a finitely presented group, and I'm going to call some things something or maybe maybe not maybe yeah so maybe I'll just take so I take some normal subgroup n and g now if my parameter r is sufficiently far between the uh, longest loop in g so the longest length of a relator in g and, but it's smaller than the um, shortest non-trivial element in N. Word, word length. Uh, the w yeah, the, 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 the length coming from the word length on G. Uh, yes, oh yes, oh sorry, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and here obviously it's the, it's the length in the free group on the generating set of, of G. So if I take this parameter sufficiently far between these two things, then actually if I look at... So then if I look at pi 1 at this scale of my Cayley graph of this um, quotient based at the identity, then it will actually detect the normal subgroup by which I've quotiented. Okay? So... Um, Is n a simply a finite index or...? Um, no. No. So the notion of homotopy is that the two loops are homotopic if they are homotopic through loops based on Fe, because otherwise, like in topology, you can have free homotopy of loops which gives something else. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we base them at, at, at base the E, yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> I guess the, this is kind of the same thing as if you, um, you know, you take your, your Cayley graph of G mod N and then you just glue in some cells of for cells of size less than 2R, so you kind of kill off the, the relators that are coming from G in this way. Um, okay, and so why is, what is the, a good context in which we can apply this? Well, box spaces are a very good context. So now um, we can answer our question in a more structural algebraic way. So now if we assume that G is finally presented, and residually finite, um, then if we have some course equivalence between two box spaces, well, this in particular also implies that H is finally presented because the groups will be quasi-asymmetric. And so what this uh, result on the course fundamental group gives is simply... Um, it's simply telling us that actually there's an isomorphism between pretty much all of these subgroups. So I'm going to write this like this. Um, so this is isomorphism. Whenever I write two lines here, it's an isomorphism. So I write this in quotation marks just because uh, there could be some small perturbations for finitely many of these guys where maybe they're not isomorphic, but um, in the long run, they will just be isomorphic, okay? And maybe up to some finite permutations, but yeah. Essentially, you're getting this. So in particular, this implies that the groups are commensurable, which is a very strong structural conclusion. Okay. 
So commensurable just means that uh, they, sh they share isomorphic finite index subgroups. But yeah, of course, uh, saying this is, is stronger. Yeah. Uh, okay. So just uh, some comments about the proof of this. Uh, so it's not absolutely immediate, but um, so this actually uses so this actually uses the result with alarm. Um, So in the results with Allah, actually, uh, what ends up happening is that each of the pieces that are making up the box spaces, um, you actually get a uniform quasi-asymmetry between uh, these pieces. And then you can use that um, in order to apply this to the um, course fundamental group. So and how would you apply that? Well, actually, what you end up getting is that if um, you have some, um, you have some, let's say, Cayley graph of some group A, and you have a quasi-asymmetry of that with some Cayley graph of a group B, then what you actually end up getting is that uh, there's a map, there's a subjective map from the coarse fund fundamental group at scale R of A onto the coarse fundamental group of uh, B, except it's not with the same parameter. You actually have to change the parameter a little bit according to the um, quasi-asymmetry constant C. So whatever quasi-asymmetry constant C you have here controlling your quasi-asymmetry, you actually get a subjective map from this coarse fundamental group onto a coarse fun fundamental group of your other group. But we, at a slight cost, you have to change the parameter slightly. But what you can do in box space is because you have this um, limiting behavior that the ni are getting smaller and smaller. It's a filtration. They have um, trivial intersection. So what you can do is actually you can go back the other way, OK? And um, so you can go back the other way via subjection of the cost, again, of changing the, um, the parameter here. But if your ni is sufficiently far along in your sequence, then actually this will just stay the same. So what you end up getting is a subjection of this group onto itself. Um, it's isomorphic to the subgroup by which we quotiented in the case of our box spaces. And um, because we're taking residually finite groups, these groups are actually Hopfian. So it actually uses, uses Hopficity here in quite a <coughs> funny way. We're actually using the hopficity of the uh, subgroups um, in the filtration. So, okay, great. I'm almost out of time. So, um, just some uh, small remarks about this uh, result and some consequences. So. Of course, just as um, in the result with Alain, you can also conclude that um, some objects which are constructed in this way are coarsely different, okay? just as we did with expanders, showing that there are infinitely many coarse equivalence classes of expanders. So you can do such things. For example, you can prove that um, there's infinitely many coarse equivalence classes containing Ramanujan graphs. I mean, being Ramanujan isn't, of course, um, invariance, but uh, you have infinitely many course equivalence classes containing Ramanujan graphs. Um, but a more interesting um, kind of strange consequence of this is that you, have the you can have the following situation because of the very strong rigidity of these objects. Um, so we're used to, with Cayley graphs, if we have uh, groups which are the same up to finite index, we're used to the Cayley graphs just being quasi-asymmetric, right? That's something we've all kind of internalized. But um, in the, the case of box space, you can have some weird situations. So I 
have the following corollary. So there exists a group G with filtrations Mi and Ni such that there is some uniform bound, let's say D, such that um, the index of Ni is always bounded by D in Mi. Okay, so these subgroups are very, very close to each other in a uniform way all the time, uh, but such that the box spaces with respect to these subgroups are actually different. So you assume that the filtrations are in, in, uh, in, in the, the same group G. No, but the, they are, uh, ah, nested. nested. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, indeed, yeah. So yeah. we always have this. Um, and the index of uh, Ni is always bounded in Mi. And yet, uh, these box spaces that we're getting are not going to be coarsely equivalent. So if you think about it, you know, this means that this condition means that the uh, G mod Ni are just bounded covers of these G mod Mi with this, you know, a bounded index here, but yet um, these objects have very differing coarse behavior, which is kind of strange. Um, and just to finish, I just wanted to mention another result by uh, Bigolo. Um, so Vigolo um, exploited this kind of coarse fundamental group framework in order to prove that actually for these warped cones, so these objects which are created using group actions on manifolds, um, there actually are some examples of expanders which are coarsely simply connected, so which have trivial coarse fundamental group. And that proves that they're completely different from any of these expanders constructed using this box space uh, structure. So any of these expanders coming from property T groups or others, um, so uh, these warped space expanders with trivial coarse fundamental group are really a very new example of expanders that, that we have. Okay, I'll finish there, thank you. Yes, so if you apply the last theorem you mentioned, <coughs> to try to understand Ramesh Lenikov's question. So why, why you can't solve this question? Like mm. I guess the Ramesh Lenikov question is more about the, the kind of the algebraic nature of the quotient. So a lot of these results in that direction, they use things like the profinite completion, which is like an algebraic way of encoding these quotients. Whereas we assume something a priori stronger, or well, something different, something geometric, about these quotients, um, yeah. And in fact, these um, you see these these uh, box spaces are much finer objects than profinite completions because if you uh, just just to give an example, so if you take a profinite completion with respect to some sequence and with respect to an interlinking nested sequence of subgroups, then the profinite completion you end up getting is the same. Um, and a lot of these results which explore this object, use profinite completions. Whereas box spaces, you can have um, these kind of interlinking subgroups, but which give you, again, box spaces with, very, with very different coarse properties. So uh, box spaces are finer objects, and thus assuming some kind of equivalence between them, it's, it's a stronger statement. So we're assuming something stronger. So unfortunately, it can't seem to shed any light on, on, on this kind of thing. So, so if you choose uh, the subgroup to produce box spaces which are uh, equivalent, uh, then you deduce that the two groups are commensurable. And what is missing is that you want an isomorphism, or is, is there something? No, it's just yeah. So if when you assume that the box spaces are coarsely equivalent, that's that's a strong geometric assumption. Whereas whereas here, what you would be assuming is that really the class of the, the set of isomorphism classes of all the finite quotients is just the same. But you right, but you don't know anything about the you don't know anything about how the quotients will behave geometrically. So you know if you if you fix just because you know what the set of finite quotients might be, you don't know that they'll be isom I mean they'll, they'll be 
it'll be the same set, but it won't be the same set geometrically, possibly. And you need to fix generators for A to behave in the same way as the generators. Exactly, yeah, and you, and you can't do that. Mm. Yeah, it's to do with, yeah, cha choosing the generating set for that so that it works, but... Is the theorem, <coughs> theorem okay when G is just profanately, profanately presented? Ah, yeah. oh, uh... So what does it mean, profanely presented? So let's say if the uh, profanity completion is finitely presented as profanity group. Uh-huh. Um, oh, possibly. It might work. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure as, as it stands, but it might, it might also work, yeah. I know it doesn't work for, I mean, for example, it doesn't work for finitely generated groups in general. Um, you can have uh, some examples, like very simple examples using wreath products for which the groups are quasi um sorry the groups are not commensurable but the box spaces are closely <coughs> equivalent even just isometrically box spaces i think you can get with finely generated groups but um yeah oh, no, i'd have to check uh, that's ni that's a nice question thank you